An experienced task force headed by former President Eliud Williams to map out a sustainable future for Dominica. Budget constraints could force the City Council to impose an environmental tax on organizers of public events within the city limits. And the displaced people of Dubic eager to move into their new Petro castles. I'm Julian Morris with the Channel 5 News. The details coming up. A task force being led by former President His Excellency Eliud Williams is in the process of shaping a new Dominica. Idola John Baptist has that story. The National Reconstruction Task Force was appointed in September to map a path for the social and economic advancement in the post Erica recovery. It's a voluntary advisory body to the Prime Minister, making up accomplished and highly trained professionals in their fields. His Excellency Eliud Williams is leading that group which includes retired cabinet secretary and attorney Julian Johnson, past government minister and businessman Ivo Nassif, businessman Gary Ed, senior counsel Alec Lawrence, agronomist Gregory Schillingford, economist Dr. Valda Henry, chartered engineer Anthony Burnett Biscom, ambassador Edward Lambert, with banker Murray Terrace Johnson serving as the group's secretary. We've been called upon by the prime minister to help on a voluntary basis in the planning and reconstruction of our infrastructure and economy so that um, the infrastructure and economy would become shock resilient so that we can withstand in the future um, events like Tropical Storm Erica much better. On Monday, Mr. Williams spoke to Channel 5 News in his first media interview since that assignment. The group met last Monday and has since started planning a strategic framework for reconstruction of the country's physical, economic, and social infrastructure. They are to identify critical pillars in the economy for growth and sustainable development. During the last few weeks, we were first of all um, paying attention to some requests from the Prime Minister to look at um, requests for assistance from various bodies. What we have done since is to agree that in going forward, we need to be doing things differently. So that in recent times, we have spent quite some time and, and effort towards developing what we call a new vision for Dominica. And that is consistent with the United Nations Development Agenda to 2030. Tourism, agriculture, business, and social services have been identified as four of the critical areas to set that new Dominica vision. Under that umbrella, productivity, competitiveness, and sustainability will be looked at. And we are saying Dominica 2030, which will be consistent with the Sustainable Development Goals set out by the United Nations, must be a country that reflects strong and focused leadership. And that leadership must be public, and private sector, and civil society. I think there's a tendency when we speak about leadership for people to always focus about political leadership. But we're saying the political leadership alone is not going to build that new Dominica. It's a Dominica that must also have disciplined the people. But also, equally important, it's a Dominica where in the social services, people must know you have quality health care. You have education that is perhaps Dominica regional focus, but international in its scope. So that wherever that Dominican finds himself um, in 2030 or post-2030, you can hold your own, as we say colloquially. In more news now, limited manpower and an insufficient budget are increasing the challenges facing the Roseau City Council. Here's more. As far as the mayor of Roseau is concerned, complaints about the upkeep of the city, especially after Tropical Storm Erica, are unjustified given the circumstances her workforce is operating under. Her worship Irene John says the storm not only caused the laborers to double their effort, but it also cost her office a lot more money to maintain the cleanup of Roseau. Our men really, really, really pushed it and they really stretched to the extra mile to have the city as it is today. On that note, Mayor John is recommending an environmental tax to cover cleaning up after public events organized in the city and surroundings. She spoke following a concert on Saturday at the Newtown Savannah. The persons who are planning those activities are supposed to come to us 
write or come to us and let us know exactly you know what type of activities are they going to have so we'll have an idea as to what is going to happen so we'll make arrangements to have the city clean because we have to pay persons to do that out of our funds that we do not really um cater for when i said that persons should pay that environmental tax that would involve um persons coming in to pay money in addition to just you know, paying a fee to set up set up a, a tent by the road. In most cases, a lot, a lot, a lot of spillover, a lot of plastic containers all over the place, a lot of plastic bottles and plates and what have you. Event organizers and street vendors must actually seek the city council's permission. So it's not just jump up to them and say you're going to have a sewer in Roseau tonight, set up your tent, set up your, your, your music and what have you, and then the next day the city is, is in a mess. Who is responsible to do the cleaning? There are fees that they have to pay. In some cases, they do not even pay the fees. We just see tents set up over the, on, on the sidewalk. And, and I want to send out a very, very clear message to persons out there who are planning activities in the city to please come into the office and to discuss with us what type of activities are they planning to have in the city. Because some of the tents will have to go down. We have to bring our men out on a Sunday, and you know, on Sunday is double time. It's like almost a day work on a Sunday to clean up the city based on the activities that went on the, the, the Sunday, Saturday night. Okay, when you say a lot, can you give us an idea what type of budget is the city council working with? Well, <laughs> we have a lot of limitations. <laughs> and our budget doesn't take into consideration clean up the city on a Sunday. A, a few thousand dollars that I, 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 I just cannot give you a, a, a direct figure, but it, it is costing a lot, a lot of money. In other news, Tourism Minister Robert Tong has said that Dominica will have to do more to entice cruise lines to add the destination on the itinerary. Tong was speaking in the context of a recently released report on a survey conducted by the Business Research and Economic Advisors on behalf of the Florida Caribbean Cruise Association for the 2014-2015 cruise season. The report is one that tells us that we have a lot of work to do. Government can't do it by itself. We all have to do it together because as you can see from all the various um, points that were made, it is not just government related, it's also private sector related. In the Brea survey, 68% of cruise passengers said they would not likely return or were not likely to return to the destination for a land-based or resort vacation within the next three years, while 35% said they were likely to return. 75%, however, said that the destination met or exceeded their expectations, and 25% said it did not meet their expectations. Cruise tourists further gave a 77% satisfaction rate with the overall destination, and 23% said they were not satisfied. Um, to me, I am happy that the report came out because it confirms all the things that we, we knew. And based on the advocacy, based on the, on the regular meetings we've been having with all the stakeholders, all of these things that have, been, that have been spoken about in the report, we are aware of them. The Ministry of Tourism will continue reviewing. So even when we had the first ship, we ensured that a few days after we had a, a post-mortem to see what were the issues so we can try to fix those. Um, we'll, tr we'll try to have these um, practically not every week because as, as time goes along, you'll have more ships coming in. And we'll have to do it on a week. Sorry, not, not after every ship, but maybe on a weekly basis with as many stakeholders as possible to ensure that um, we know what the issues are and we can try to address them. One of the things that we've done is to try and speak with the stakeholders on a, on a more frequent basis so that we know what the issues are and we can address them quickly. And a community displaced and evacuated after the passage of Tropical Storm Erica is eager to move in to its new Petro Casas. In this area just above the police station at Centre in Grand Bay, 50 petrol castles will be erected to accommodate families from the Dubé community. The community originally populated with about 150 people was one of the areas evacuated and declared emergency disaster zones. Over 80 people from the community of Dubé are staying right here in the community centre in Grand Bay. Channel 5 News came to speak to some of the members to find out how they feel about the move to the Petrocasas very soon. We are delighted, we are grateful for that because as I just said, we all sleep in one area. So as soon as we get the Petrocasa, that would be great, that would be a relief. We are very happy and it's one voice. No one is opposing, I don't want this, I don't want that. Everyone is ready, so as soon as we get the stuff, we can just move in. We are very thankful for that. Of the people that are staying here, how many people actually employed? Well, approximately 
six to seven persons because that is one of the main problems we had in the community of Jubik, employment and housing problem. So right now we are here, so seeing that we came from the village, well that problem will not just solve one time. So it's the same problem, but we hope to better that as soon as we get our homes, we can get out there, look for jobs, you know, to better ourselves. Well, I do my little um, farming so I can live with me and my family, I lose everything. I did not save nothing. The only thing I save is my life, and I found God for it. And your family? Yes. Do you plan to go back to your farm? Yes, whenever everything set up. Everything, whenever, whenever I get the home where I can live in, I will go back to my farm. 115 Pedro Casas were promised by the Venezuelan government and will be constructed as part of the housing project for displaced victims. I am Lurian Graham Carter reporting for Channel 5 News. The mother of a Grand Bay man who was found dead on Sunday morning says her son did not deserve to die that way. 46-year-old Presley Fontaine was found dead at his home in Beriquar early Sunday morning. Julieta Pinard says that morning she was told that her son was involved in an altercation the previous day that resulted in some injuries. Up to now I'm sick. I can't sleep because my mind is on him alone. And my stomach, as if I'm a person, I have two operations and I can't walk, I'm sick there. And somebody call in, come in and tell you how they kill you. How you would take that? I didn't frighten in that kind of way because I know he's a boy. When you see he drink his little rum, he will curse him. He will tell you something. Boy is not a boy that hating people. Because if he was a bad boy, all grand bad people would be against him. Nobody against him. Because everybody saying, ah, we let him multiply come Presley. He tell my beaten, you tray Presley, hey Larry. His neighbor for two years says although Fountain was a troublesome man, he didn't fight with others. She gave her account of that morning when his body was found. Well, a guy that living at the back, he not living at the back there, but he have his garage at the back there. So when he came there, he saw blood. So he he called Presley, so he thought it was an animal Presley kill because he always killing all kind of animal to cook. Mm -hmm. So it's when he go closer, he saw Presley lie down there with blood and thing and well had an he wasn't breathing, nothing, he was dead. So he called my daughter. My daughter was outside, so he called my daughter and he told my daughter, look, Presley died there. So my daughter called me and when we, I come outside, I go at the back, I pass there, I go at the back there, I saw him well, hard and thing, with blood all over him and fly was all in his face. That is all I see, I did the night, I, do, I didn't hear nothing, I didn't hear him screaming, I didn't hear nothing, I just, it was a shock. News. She says the man who found him was his cousin. Meanwhile, Sergeant Pelham John Baptist of the Police Public Relations Committee says one man is being held for questioning. The body was put at the hospital, it was transported to the hospital. Um, the police has reason to believe that it was a suspicious death, so it's, it's, it's a suspect the homicide. And as we speak, um, there is one person in custody assisting the police investigations. Um, the body is now at the mortuary. We, we, we will convene an inquest and a post-mortem examination to determine the cause of death. The person being held for questioning was apprehended on Monday morning. Coming up on the Channel 5 News Market Day with a difference and we'll meet the latest centenarian in Dominica. Thank you for staying with us. Mayor of Portsmouth, Titus Francis, says no better theme could have been chosen for this year's independence than rebuilding Dominica together. His worship spoke at Market Day with a difference in Portsmouth on Saturday. He says even if the north of the country was not as devastated by Erica as the south, the message of rebuilding together is for all of us. Both Mayor Francis and the parliamentary representative sounded a note of concern about maintaining a clean and healthy environment. This year, we're talking about rebuilding Dominica together. And again, inside of that theme, I still hear the song of responsibility. And so, coming out of the experiences of Tropical Storm Erica, 
we should have learned even if Portsmouth and the greater north of Dominica to a very large extent was spared by the devastation of Erica but the lesson the message coming out of Erica speaks to us in this area as much as it had spoken to people in the Petit Savan, Dibic, and the south of Dominica. And even here in Portsmouth, each and every one of us must take the responsibility, a personal responsibility, to make sure that our own little sphere of activity is clean and tidy. We cannot leave it up to the town council. We cannot only leave it up to the pal rep. We cannot leave it to the government. Each and every one of us have a responsibility, brothers and sisters, to make sure that our surroundings is clean and tidy. The award for best dressed female vendor went to Anelta Abraham, while Decima Debon got the award for longest serving vendor. And the provision of Wi-Fi access to schools and the public is well on track. That's the word from Minister for Technology, Kelva Daru. Earlier this year, government announced plans to make Wi-Fi access available in the botanical gardens. Wi-Fi is a facility which allows owners of computers, smartphones or other smart devices to connect to the internet or communicate with one another wirelessly within a particular area. The botanical garden, as we speak, it already has the Wi-Fi functioning, so it is a, it is a collaborative effort between the Ministry of Information Technology and the NTRC. Um, so the Wi-Fi is already in the gardens functioning, so if you were to go to the gardens right now with your smart device, you'd be able to access it. With the One Tablet Per Child initiative now completed, means of connection is even more important in the secondary schools around the island. We, we are well on track and you'd be, quite, you'd be aware as well that um, we've also provided wireless service to the secondary schools to aid in the advancement of the tablet program that we've already started. So all this is an effort really to promote information technology and promote um, the provision of broadband to young people or an effort to make life much easier for them. An official launching ceremony to mark the accomplishment of establishing wireless access in the Botanic Gardens will be held this week. In other news, the Dominica Cancer Society is calling for a cancer registry to help keep track of the number of cancer cases on the island. The call by the president of the society coincides with the observance of Breast Cancer Awareness Month this month. The number of cancer cases in Dominica has been on the increase, yet it is difficult to highlight the exact number and type of cancer. Cancer is a disease caused by an uncontrolled division of abnormal cells in a part of the body. Untreated cancers can cause serious illness and death. All right, so this is one of our major challenges. And as a society, there is a need for a cancer registry. We are aware that there is a steady increase in the number of diagnosed cases. And you know, this is an opportunity for us to make a call as a society to the government or to any NGO out there who want to provide some form of um, um, studies for someone to go across to learn how to develop that registry. The cancer registry can go a long way in helping the society gather information and keep track of cancer cases in Dominica. This is one area for us that remains a challenge and for us to take proactive steps and to move forward. We can't just come and say every time that there is an increase. We need a definite number. And more and more, we, while some persons go through the public sector and we are able to keep track of them, there are many persons who are using private agencies they, or they do their treatments out of Dominica. And because of that, it becomes the challenge becomes even greater. So we are really making a call for a registry to be introduced locally. Cornelia says there are many challenges in creating a cancer registry. However, having one available would be beneficial. We are aware that there are more and more persons coming forward in terms of treatment. But as to getting a definite number, as to the number of persons being affected by cancer, we can't. We can tell you definitely that there is an increase in every type of cancer. But because we do not have a cancer registry locally, we do not have the information compiled in a scientific way whereby we can make some judgments on the way forward. 
The Dominica Cancer Society is set to hold elections for a new executive in November. Tuesday, 27th October, will be observed in Dominica's Pink Day. The aim of this day is to wear pink as a sign of solidarity for those who died as a result of breast cancer and those who have survived the disease. And the Dominica Association of Persons with Disabilities celebrated its 32nd anniversary on Monday. The association seeks to help foster a more friendly environment for disabled individuals in Dominica. During the association's existence, it has made notable impact in Dominica regarding the inclusion of disabled people in society. So when we first began, there was an attitude of people having uh, been of one of pity, of sympathy, looking at us as welfare cases, as persons deserving of charity, persons who have to remain homes and become and remain liabilities of their families, persons who were not able to, to learn, who were not able to earn a job, who should not go out there and enjoy themselves and have fun. But as of the work that we have done, as I said, the mentality, the, the perception, the misconception, the attitude has changed tremendously. Um, we can see in the area of education, persons with disabilities now have equal access to schools from the preschool up to the tertiary level. There have also been modifications to the physical environment to be more disabled people friendly, though according to Murphy, further improvements can be made. Two, so we have seen some improvements, particularly in public buildings. Um, the sidewalks leave much to be desired, especially in Roseau, I must say, but um, we have seen um, institutions like the banks, like um, some schools, um, making the effort to provide access to, to ensure that um, persons with disabilities who have mobility impairments are able to access their facilities. We would have liked to see a little more of the lifts, elevators going up, in the, especially those businesses that have more than one, one floor. It is very um, dehumanizing and degrading that when a person in a wheelchair wants to go into a, 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 a public building, a, 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 a store, a supermarket, something to do business, that they cannot enter just because there are two steps. The DAPD has also made strides in the regional and international communities, and this has helped to further advocacy work in Dominica. Um, agencies and governments like the European Union, like the Japanese government, like the British High Commission, and the British government, the High Commission, the Canadian Fund for Local Initiative, the Basic Need Trust Fund, Caribbean Development Bank, all these institutions and agencies have funded a project of ours at some time or another. Even up to UNESCO, we have received monies from as well. So over the years, the work that we have done, it is visible, and we are very accountable, we are very transparent, and I think that encourages institutions, agencies, and individuals to support us. The signature fundraising event for the DAPD will be on Friday, 30th of October, when the association hosts its annual Dollar Day. Andrea Louis, Channel 5 News. A member of parliament for the Grand Fond constituency has called on Dominicans to pay more attention to the agriculture industry. The MP was speaking at a ceremony to celebrate the 100th birthday of Josephine Florestine Lawrence as Dominica added another centenarian to its list. The Grand Four MP says a focus on agriculture and eating locally grown foods can contribute to the longevity of the Dominican people. Continue to engage in activities that will build on your health and well-being. I'm talking about our practices in agriculture. And we have seen a neglect in our communities. We see no longer the vegetable gardens that were part of the pot at home. Let us engage ourselves in more agricultural practices. The cultivation of crops, your local starches, dashing, the bread foods, the yams, the potatoes, your vegetables, your fruits. And let us ensure that we live healthy lives. Stevenson says a physical activity is a good lifestyle practice that people can engage in. I can boast as a pilot that we in Grand for now have a good playing field, one that will soon be commissioned, and that we expect a little more engagement in sporting activities. We know that Grand Four and Mount John have 
persons who are engaged in many sporting activities such as football. But we expect upon the commissioning of our football field that we will see other sporting activities and ensure that our people are not just spiritually and mentally well, but also physically well. President of the Dominica Council on Aging called on Dominicans to take care of the elderly in society. We must continue to stress that our seniors should be allowed to age healthily and gracefully. Thus, we must examine our lifestyle practices and adopt positive and effective means for staying healthy. I know that since the passage of Tropical Storm Erica, life has become more challenging for some of our seniors and their families. But we as a nation must stand strong and rally around our seniors to ensure that they are not left to fend on their own. Josephine Mamatin Lawrence was born on 23rd October 1915. Up next, Sports Highlights with Kenny Williams. In cricket, South Africa won the five-match series against India 3-2. Sunday's game ended with South Africa leading by 214 runs and declared victorious to close their fifth ODI against India. After 50 overs, the South African team scored 438 for four. Decock, Plessy and Villiers amassed 361 runs for their team, contributing to the win against India. India tried their hardest to beat their rival, but were only able to score 224 all out in 36 overs. Rabada and Stain together took seven of India's wickets. Decock was declared player of the match and Villiers player of the series. Meantime, England will not taste victory as Pakistan won the series 1-0 as they beat England by 178 runs. The Pakistan team gave England 222 for three in 61 overs on Saturday, while England on Sunday replied with 130 for three in 54 overs. England, still hoping for victory, scored 312 all out in 137.3 overs on Monday. Riaz of Pakistan was declared player of the match, while Yasir took four wickets for his team. More cricket excitement as West Indies women won the series against Pakistan 3-1 when they scored 183 for four in 42.2 overs. Pakistan women scored 182 for five in 50 overs, losing to West Indies by six wickets. Taylor's efforts paid off for the, win, for the Windies team when she amassed 87 not out and was declared player of the match and the series. West Indies women secured two points in the ICC Women's Championship. In more West Indian cricket, the West Indies lost their test against Sri Lanka by 72 runs. Sri Lanka, winning, by, winning the series 2-0, scored 200 and 206 all out on Monday. West Indies, despite their efforts, could only amass 163 and 171 all out in 65.5 overs. Bravo contributed just over half a century for his team, but was caught by Matthews. Hirath and Siri Wadner claimed seven of, West Indies, of the West Indies wickets, showing no mercy for the West Indies team. Siri Wadner was crowned the player of the match and his teammate Hirath player of the series. Kicking off now in football, Dublin Football Club maintained their winning streak this weekend, while defending champions Exodus claimed yet another win in the DFA Lime Premier League. Gerald George has this report. Number four in the DFA Lime Premier League ended with Dublin Football Club picking up their fourth win in as many matches to maintain their perfect record, while Northern Concrete and Steel Bombers remained in relegation zone. On Saturday, defending champions Kyrie FM Exodus Football Club dropped another two points as they played to a two-all draw with Caribbean Cool Harlem United in the first match of a doublehead at the Benjamin Park in Portsmouth. Don Jovier and Nigel Sanderson scored for Harlem with Lex Militi and Dylan Carlisle scoring for Exodus. In the second match, Randolph Peltier continued his fine scoring form as he found the back of the nets twice to pilot Buffett State Football Club to a 2 0 victory over Sajiko Southeast. The action moved to the Windsor Park Stadium on Sunday, where Malta India Icons Football Club registered their first win for the season with a 1 0 victory over Northern Concrete and Steel Bombers. Len Walters scored for Icons. Bombers are the only team without a victory. 
In the second match, Dubla came from behind to defeat Sainman Midlam United 3-1. Travis Joseph maintained his consistency for the season with two goals, with Chad Bertrand scoring one. Delbert Hazel got the lone goal for Midlam United. In more football, Domlek Dominica Grammar School secured a 7-0 victory over Pierre Charles Secondary in the under-17 category on Friday. John Baptist and Woodman secured two goals each, and Timothy, Bedminister, and Philip won each to bring their team to victory. And finally, in handball, a new and exciting sport, beach handball, is expected to be introduced to Dominica soon, as training sessions for coaches and officials wrapped up on the weekend. Participants at the training sessions went home with a certificate on Sunday and were charged with the responsibility of teaching the sport to athletes. I have to congratulate f uh, for your beautiful country. I've never seen this kind of beautiful green and natural country. Second, I've never seen this like of polite people like in Dominica. I have to say thank you for this possibility to teach you and introduce you this wonderful sport. As Your weather report is next. Good evening, Dominica, and welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I'm your presenter, Marshall Alexander. We begin by taking a look at earlier infrared satellite imagery. What it showed is this area of convection associated with a frontal trough, which resulted in unstable conditions across the Lesser Antilles today. Now, taking a look at earlier visible satellite imagery, what it showed some multi layered clouds across the region during today. Now, earlier radar imagery indicated scattered showers mainly across the southern portion of the island chain today. Tonight's weather is expected to be partly cloudy to cloudy with a few scattered showers and tomorrow's weather is expected to be partly cloudy with some scattered showers expected mainly during the afternoon. Sea conditions are expected to be slight to moderate with waves peaking near 5 feet. Conditions for the next 3 days Partly cloudy to cloudy skies with some scattered showers can be expected on Tuesday and Thursday. However, an improvement in conditions can be expected on Wednesday. The rest of the Caribbean tomorrow. Partly cloudy to cloudy skies with a few scattered showers expected across the central portion of the region with some thunderstorm activity expected across the extreme northern and southern portion of the island chain. Our international cities forecast. Partly cloudy skies can be expected in Miami and Caracas, some rain expected in London, cloudy conditions expected in New York, and clear skies expected in Beijing. Sunrise tomorrow will be at 6 a.m. and sunset will be at 5.39 p.m. Please remember that we are in the hurricane season. For more information, you can call the weather hotline at 447-5555 or visit the website at weather.gov.dm. Thanks for viewing. Have a good night. The headlines again, an experienced task force headed by former President Elliot Williams to map out a sustainable future for Dominica. Budget constraints could force the City Council to consider imposing an environmental tax on organizers of public events within the city limits. And the displaced people of Dubique eager to move into the new petrol castles. Let us know what you think. Email us at news at marpin2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on YouTube. On behalf of the production team, I'm William Morris. Thanks for watching. Join us tomorrow.